Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the seminar um, presented by Dr. Oliver Haydorn, who we're most fortunate to have in Australia at present, and more importantly, being able to travel um, from Queensland to South Australia. We seem to be most favoured in that respect. And, uh, Oliver has written extensively and studied um, the work and life of the late Major C. H. Douglas and his economic theory, proposing a social dividend. Um, he's trying to cram into today, if I can use that word cram, um, into a series of sh very short lectures, <clears throat> the theory of Douglas social credit and the explanations for that theory and how it works. He's going to use a series of animations uh, to support his uh, lecture courses and uh, we're all looking forward to hearing from you Oliver. Most welcome. So I, I thought I'd begin by introducing you to this fellow, Clifford Hugh Douglas. Clifford Hugh Douglas, or C.H. Douglas, as he is most commonly called, was born in England in 1879 and died in Scotland in 1952. Douglas was a mechanical engineer who had worked on various engineering projects in different parts of the world. Outside of the UK, he held posts in Canada, in Argentina, and in India. During the First World War, he was a major in the Royal, Royal uh, Flying Corps, hence he is often referred to by his military title of Major, Major Douglas. Beginning in 1917, C.H. Douglas began writing on economic, financial, political, philosophical, cultural, and historical issues, and continued to do so until his death. The line of thought, or the, the take in our world, which Douglas developed in his writings, became known as social credit, which we'll talk more about in a moment. Accordingly, after the First World War, Douglas founded a worldwide movement dedicated to disseminating and eventually implementing his social credit ideas. The basic purpose of that movement was to seek and then to achieve the genuine improvement or betterment of society. As the leader of this movement, Douglas wrote many books and articles and delivered many speeches, some of which were broadcast on radio, which was the television of the time. He was also invited to give evidence before a number of banking and other governmental inquiries in various countries, in Canada, the United Kingdom, and in New Zealand. And he traveled the world spreading, his, uh, spreading awareness of the need for a social credit style reform. In 1934, as part of his worldwide tour, Douglas actually came to Australia. He arrived first at Perth and spoke there on the radio. And later, 12,000 people filled a stadium in Sydney to hear him deliver an address in person. So social credit, I suppose it's all been sent down the Orwellian memory hole, but social credit had a presence in Australia, I would say a significant one at a certain period of time. So what is social credit? Well, I might begin uh, to answer this question by stipulating what social credit is not. And you'll hear this over and over again in the course of today's presentations. The social credit we are talking about here has nothing, absolutely nothing, to do with the totalitarian reward and punishment system which was introduced a few years ago by the Chinese government. Our social credit is the, if you like, it's the original social credit and was known by that name many, many decades before the Chinese surveillance program came online. More positively, we can say that social credit without capitals, so small s, small c, describes a type of power that is present in any society or association of human beings. 
namely the power to achieve certain objectives by collaborating, by working together. Some societies, some countries possess a great deal of social credit. They can achieve a lot of different things, more or less efficiently, by working together on common projects. Other societies and nations, for various reasons, possess a weaker degree of social credit. That is to say, their power to get things done by working in association is weaker, either in terms of the, the scope of things that they can achieve or the efficiency with which they can achieve those things, or both. So social credit, this time with capitals, capital S, capital C, might be described as the science of association, but a science that has a very practical orientation. What increases the social credit of society? What weakens it? What interferes with it? What are the barriers to an enhanced social credit and how might they be removed? These are the types of questions that we are we're chiefly interested in as social creditors. One of Douglas' central insights is that the, the social credit of a society can only function optimally or be, be fully actualized if the society successfully gives people the results that they are looking for from their association and this with the least amount of trouble and, and resource consumption. When societies fail to serve the common good because systems, institutions, or individuals impede the social credit, then the people whom society is meant to serve uh, get restless and may start taking action themselves to overthrow the systems or individuals who are interfering with them. So if we, if we want to avoid revolutions, because revolutions are ugly, bloody, and destructive events, social credit, Douglas social credit, offers a path to a more stable, flourishing society. And what is that path? How do you how do you maximize the social credit of a society? C.H. Douglas says that what we need to aim for is the maximum decentralization of power, so the maximum decentralization of political and economic power that is compatible with a functioning and healthy social order. Now, there are four broad areas of investigation that, that social credit as the science of association incorporates. And this is reflected very much in Douglas's writing. So you've got philosophy, um, including especially social philosophy. You've got economics, including especially the subject of finance. You've got political theory, and you've got historical theory. In today's lectures, we are, of course, only going to be looking at the financial economic aspects of Douglas's teachings. And we can only really do that in outline. There's, there's so much more that would need to be said to do a really thorough job. But uh, as this is entitled, it's a crash course. But I wanted to make it clear uh, from the outset that social credit is a lot broader and deeper than just matters of finance or economics, as important as those things are. Because sometimes you get people who think or who say that you know, social credit is just about monetary reform, when in fact social credit encompasses a whole social orientation involving the proper or right relationships between individuals, on the one hand, and the groups or associations of which they are a part on the other. The monetary reform proposals, which you'll hear about later today, are just a means of putting the individual into the right kind of financial and economic relationship with respect to his association. Episode 1. What is the purpose of the economy?
We're often told that the purpose of the economy is to make money, or to create jobs, or to provide moral discipline, or even that it has no normative purpose at all. But what if none of these assertions is true? According to the social credit analysis of Major C. H. Douglas, not to be confused with Chinese social credit, the economy has only one fundamental purpose: the delivery of the goods and services people need to survive and flourish with the least amount of human labor and resource consumption. How can we confirm that this is correct? Well, consider the following thought experiment. Let's assume, contrary to fact and for the sake of argument, that the purpose of the economy is money making. What would happen if a nation's economy maximized its financial returns but did not provide its citizens with enough goods and services for them to live? The classical and most extreme example for this phenomenon would be an economy that had exported all of its production overseas. Businesses and workers would then have plenty of money, but they would also have nothing to spend it on. Without goods and services to consume, the members of an economic association would eventually perish from starvation, from exposure to the elements, or from other forms of societal collapse, such as a lack of healthcare. Running an economy as if its ultimate purpose were the maximization of financial benefits is self-defeating and unsustainable when taken to its logical conclusion. For this reason, it cannot be the case that the economy exists for the purpose of money making. The same sort of reasoning can be applied with respect to employment or work. Is the purpose of the economy to create jobs, as many jobs as possible? Well, what would happen if, in an economy run, let's say under a command system where the government totally controls economic life, all sorts of jobs were created, enough to provide everyone with employment in perpetuity, but insufficient goods and services were being produced to maintain the population? Once again, we see that job creation cannot be the economy's purpose either. What then is a sufficient condition for keeping the economy going? The only objective which meets that requirement is actually delivering the goods and services which people expect. Money and jobs are secondary matters. The purpose of production is consumption. If that end is accomplished efficiently, which it should be, so that we can have time and energy to spend on other things besides mere material provisioning, then the economy will give us everything we need to survive and flourish, while calling on the least amount of human labor and consuming the least amount of resources. To treat money making, employment, or any other incidental, legitimate or otherwise, as the economy's arch purpose is to pervert the economic system from the get-go. And that matters because when things are perverted, they break down. This animated series was sponsored by the Clifford Hugh Douglas Institute for the Study and Promotion of Social Credit. For more information on Douglas Social Credit, please visit socred.org or socialcredit.com.au. Be sure to like this video and please subscribe to our channel. All right. So Douglas, as I mentioned before, was an engineer, and that meant that. When he looked at the economy, he looked at it quite naturally from an engineering point of view. And one of the first things that an engineer wants to know whenever he is faced with some new project or task is, is what is the objective? What is the purpose that we are trying to achieve? When we know what the objective is, we can then design the bridge or the machine or the electrical grid or whatever it is appropriately, so that the purpose of the project. Can be fulfilled in the easiest possible way. In the case of the economy, Douglas says that the purpose of the economy is to deliver the goods and services that people need to survive and flourish, with the least amount of labor and resource consumption. Once we know that and, and can agree on that, then we can design a financial software and an economic system. Or method of organizing our behavior, so that this objective can be fulfilled in the real world. This is why, in social credit economics, the the question of the economy's purpose is paramount. It is it is the the point de départ? It's the, it's the the point of departure for everything else. This question has to be settled correctly, settled rightly, before we can meaningfully discuss. Anything else in economics? So how do we know? How do we determine that this is in fact the objective of economic association? 
Well, I've provided some thought experiments in the video to try to show what happens when you, you take other suggestions to a logical conclusion. We don't have to go quite so far. We can just say every time an economy tries to substitute some other end as, as its purpose, as the purpose for which it operates, there's friction, disharmony, dissatisfaction, instability, and even degeneration and decay. So if you, you make employment, for example, say full employment, the goal of economic life, what you are in fact doing, at least you know, in our modern economies with the type of technology we've got, is this, you are taking away from the efficiency which the economy would otherwise possess. You are making people work longer and harder than what the uh, physical facts of the economy actually require in order for them to get the goods and services that they need. The result is that they don't have the time, the leisure to properly enjoy the fruits of their labor or to do too much beyond the realm of, of economic activity. Right? But as the, the Thomistic philosopher Joseph Pieper insisted, leisure is the basis of culture. The development of a rich cultural life requires leisure. If you don't have leisure, well, you know, what does that do? What does that do to your culture? We can also imagine an economy where, you know, in the extreme, as we you see in the, the video, where there is, yes, there's production, there's distribution, there's the consumption of goods and services, but everything is done by machines, right? So, and that's, if we imagine that, if that's possible, uh, we have to come to the conclusion that employment cannot be the purpose of the economy, because in that case, you can d do without any human labor at all. Uh, at the present time, employment is a physical means to an end insofar as human labor is necessary as a facilitator or driver of economic uh, activities. And from the financial point of view, employment is also a means to an end for most people because it's only or chiefly through employment that people can obtain money with which to buy the goods and services they require. But, uh, you know, if you, as an alternative, let's say if you, you make money making the purpose of the economy, again, you could end up with a situation where certain people are very rich in financial terms, in numerical terms, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they would be rich in, in real or material terms. It depends what's available, what's on offer in the economy. If, for example, the whole economy were like a giant Walmart, you don't have Walmart in Australia, but you can think of it as a, a sort of a, a, a low-end Costco, uh, the owners of that Walmart being monopolists would be very rich in financial terms, but all they could spend money on would be on stuff that Walmart produces, and most of that stuff is cheaply imported stuff, um, low-quality stuff from a certain country. And, uh, you know, so they would, maybe they would be very wealthy financially, but in, in material terms, their lifestyle would be rather poor. We can also imagine in the, in the extreme again, an economy where there is no money, or at least no money as we know it, say a Star Trek type of economy where production is so abundant and so automated that money as a motive for working or as a means for distribution is fundamentally undercut. So if the economy can function without money, well, money can't be its purpose either. So from a social credit point of view, things like money making, employment, moral discipline, or other such objectives, which people sometimes put forward as, as the purpose of the economy, are really only a means to an end or a motive or inducement to economic activity, or else they're a consequence of economic activity, but it's not the main purpose, it's not the fundamental purpose of economic activity. Yes, uh, Arnas. Oliver, you mentioned the word leisure, and I think it's important to define leisure and what you actually mean by that. Okay. 
So in, in social credit terminology, when we talk about leisure, we're not talking about idleness, but we're talking about having the economic freedom and independence to decide for yourself how to profitably spend your time. So leisure is not, uh, doesn't imply necessarily that we think it's a good thing or that we want people to be able just to sort of loaf about and not do anything. Um, rather, it, it means that they would have the freedom to decide for themselves how best to spend the, the added time, which we think the modern economy is, is if it was operating under a properly designed financial system, is well placed to give them. I think you're racking my brain um, with your comment. The objective, as I understand it, for the Reserve Bank of Australia is twofold. The first is to control inflation not to eliminate inflation, but rather control it. Mm. And the second objective is to provide employment, uh, to actually attempt to achieve full employment. Now, that to me is, is an interesting um, objective in a sense mm. that the RBA, that's tied in with the unions, the, you know, this ACTU president is part of the RBA, industrial leaders are, bankers, whatever. Mm -hmm. And yet the objective is to provide something like full employment. And of course, with automation, advanced control, and everything else that goes with it, it seems as if it's actually going against the natural grain. And yet, those are the clearly defined objectives of the RBA. Your thoughts, please. Yes. Yeah, so that's uh, that's not atypical in most. Well, I suppose in all countries, really. Uh, certainly, all Western countries, there is uh, sort of this this default policy of full employment. We were at least aiming for full employment. We know we'll never actually achieve it, but. It's something that uh, we take as, as the foundation, as, as, as one of the pillars of, of our economic system. And all governments try to uh, create employment, or you know, the political parties argue between themselves as to which political party is going to be more effective, efficient in creating jobs, uh, or at least in, in creating a climate where, where jobs will be created. So this is. Uh, this is one of the central pillars around which contemporary politics rotates. And Douglas was saying way back in the 20s and the 30s that as a result of primarily of technological advance, this no longer makes sense from a physical standpoint. This no longer makes sense as, as a, an economic pillar. Unfortunately, and we'll talk more about this later on, unfortunately, it's still a financial necessity. There's still this link between jobs and work. And so while it's not a physical necessity for everyone to be working, it's still very largely a financial necessity for everyone to work or to be, be dependent on those who do if they can't work or if their work is not available. And uh, yeah, so that is something which, which needs to be addressed. Uh, you know, each country should try to reassert its sovereignty over the financial system and its, over its own domestic economic policies and say, well, does this actually make sense? Do we, why do we need everyone working? When I reflect on uh, working, I, I think it's uh, a healthy uh, discipline and educational process. Well, we're not, um, I mean, it all depends what you need, mean by work. I think when you talk about work, most people have this notion of paid employment in mind. And certainly there's plenty of work that can be done and is done outside of paid employment. So we're not against work in the sense of meaningful activity. And, uh, and I think it's true, certainly work, both paid employment and, and work outside of the formal economy can be beneficial in various ways to people. Uh, I would also observe, though, that in many instances work can be a destructive force. And probably under current conditions, paid employment we can't quantify it. I don't have any surveys available, but it wouldn't surprise me if paid employment um, destroys and, and tears down just as much as it, as, as it builds up. Socialism and the economy, I think for it to be a successful interaction, this is where the, um, I guess, the negotiation, the successful negotiation and respect has to come in with all parties. Hmm. Um, What's your you know, elaboration on that? 
this more when we, we get towards the end. Uh, social credit, it's got the word social in it, but it's not a form of socialism. We'd say it's actually anti-socialist. So that's just one clarification. But uh, we also anticipate that if we had a social credit economy, it would be one which would benefit all people, all, all stakeholders, not necessarily to the same extent. I mean, there would still be class differences depending on if somebody in addition to, we'll talk about the dividend later, but if somebody in addition to their dividend also received a wage or a salary for some particular type of work or had other investments, um, then there, there would still be uh, inequalities in, in the society. So we're not aiming for a strictly equal we're aiming for a more equitable society, but not as one that's where you've got you know strict equality. Would you think that that's where the success would come in, though, having more the, I guess, the, the equal opportunity? Would yeah, I think I think that there would be greater stability. You see, um, if people, if if more people felt that they were beneficiaries of the economic system and they were stakeholders in it. Then, uh, and they they felt that they were being given a fair deal. Then I, I think a lot of the sort of dissatisfaction, which which often gets often gets uh, taken up in, in different other movements, wouldn't be there, and 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 we would we would have a more stable, flourishing society. Yeah. If I may make uh, some more comments about uh, the usefulness of the workplace. Mm. I had an interesting experience of turning a very boring or difficult job around, which uh, would be uh, very interesting for many other people. Um, true, uh, a, a promotion uh, uh, did did uh, assist, but the um, ability to have uh, income and use that income to further my interests uh, was a, a, a great reflection on the usefulness of the workplace. It also uh, enables one to uh, associate with, with others, obviously uh, uh, fellow workers, and this can be to the benefit of uh, your employer uh, because you can uh, uh, in increase uh, communication, uh, uh, tidy up loose ends uh, in the systems you're working in. Um, it and uh, through social contact, uh, make you aware of um, all sorts of things, uh, where to get a good tool or someone to help with uh, uh, painting the house, uh, all sorts of advice, helpful advice to, to one's life outside the workplace. Um, now, and the other thing was, uh, Socially, uh, we often meet uh, not just our fellows in the workplace, but uh, our other halves. But of course, uh, in today's modern life, uh, that sometimes has some uh, excesses. But that's also, uh, from my experience of the workplace, uh, uh, a worthwhile, very worthwhile asset of the workplace.